Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, before we begin our study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have to open your word together. And we invite your spirit's presence as we continue to look at the lines in um, the, some of the simple and basic ideas, even though they're involved, we know, Lord, that um, there are some simple concepts you want us to understand. And we just pray, Lord, that you can help me to communicate those clearly and that those who participate or watch this video will understand the things that are being presented. May your Holy Spirit teach us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so um, last week, we looked at uh, this cosmic line, and we looked at how these lines work. And so this is, um, I'm not going to continue this series a lot longer, because I think that uh, a lot of the basic concepts um, seem to be understood by people. Now, I do want to touch on a few points here uh, today, this afternoon. Um, the first is we, we talked about this line, that this is based upon the candlestick and that the branches of the candlestick tie together uh, the first and the last, the second and the sixth, the third and the fifth. And then in the center, we have the cross. And I mean, the idea of this dealing with the candlestick, I first ran across it, not so much dealing with the lines, particularly in this way, uh, but similar uh, in 2016. And it was uh, a brother from Brazil. He was a brother of one of the guys who was at the School of the Prophets when we were there, Stephen. Uh, I don't know if you remember his name, because I'm terrible with names. Yeah, I think it was uh, like Igor. Yeah, so Igor's brother. <laughs> Right? I don't remember Igor. Was his name uh, Igor? Who was the other one? I'm terrible with names. Remember when we were uh, there? Those brothers? No, not the brothers, the other, the doctor. He was Igor. Igor. And then what was his brother's name? I don't know if I ever knew. Okay. So his brother was not there, but his brother had presented this somewhere. Um, now, we also had taken this and uh, compared it to the two periods of 215 years. You remember that, Stephen? Um, so that we had, we, you had actually made a diagram or something like that. Yeah. Yes, we, it was to the, the, to the animals in Genesis 15. Yeah, yeah. Connected. So you had the, the heifer, the she goat, the ram, and the doves. Yeah. And we put the doves in the middle, if I remember correctly, is how we did it. Yes. So they, they were together there. Um, yeah, and, and then we had also put like 215 years and then another 215 years. So we used it in the line of Joseph as well. So there was there was lots that we did with it. Um, and we had some sense in which we could take the seven way marks, but we hadn't placed them on the cosmic line like this. And, and we think that this is the primary, at least I believe, this is the primary way in which um, this the lampstand should be understood. That it's, it's, it's a description of the history of the world. Now, we see, of course, in Revelation chapter 1, Christ standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now, um, in Solomon's temple, how many of these seven branch candlesticks were there? And... It was how many? Ten? Ten of them? Uh, something like that? I, I couldn't remember. Yeah, ten. Okay, ten. <clears throat> now, um, so when we look at, in, of course, in the, the earthly, the, the tabernacle, uh, there was just the one candlestick, right, with the seven branches. And so my understanding is that in Solomon's temple, um, 
uh, uh, there would have been uh, 10 of them, right? So what, what would that mean symbolically? 70. Okay, so we would have 70, right? 70 lamps. Um, How do you get 70? Well, 10 times 7. Why is it not hard to put the 7? Because Solomon put 10 in, in, this, in his temple. And there were seven. Seven on each each candlestick. Oh, okay. Sorry, my bad. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm trying to find that. Um, I have the uh, boy and mother's dream in mind, where the jewels okay. shine 10 times brighter. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's That's an interesting point as well. Second Chronicles 4, 7, he made 10 candlesticks of gold according to their form and set them in the temple, five on the right hand and five on the left. Okay. And and also that gives us the foolish and the wise too, if you think about. Yeah. Uh, there they are. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Five on the right, five on yeah. the left. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I, you know, when we think about this, I mean, there is so much that we have missed, so many little details that... Uh, become significant over time. Um, and we can also see that if, if we have one branch candlestick, um, I have a question regarding uh, that if you have 10, is it possible that we could um, somehow place the 10 in some way as well over time? It is like we, we have seven way marks. So each time we go to a way mark, I mean, we can create a, a, another candlestick, so to speak, right? Now, if we did that with these seven way marks and we say, well, each one of these is a major reform line, that we could, we would have uh, seven major reform lines in this period in the cosmic line, right? So that'd be, you know, but then we can, of course, zoom into each one of the way marks in that reform line uh, that we zoom into. So then again, we would have, I mean, it's this, you know, that poem, I met him as I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives, the seven wives, the seven cats, the seven cats, or the seven wives had seven sacks, the seven sacks had seven cats, the seven cats had seven kittens. Kittens, cats, sacks, and wives, how many were going to St. Ives? And of course, we know there was only one because they were going the other way. But um, but the idea is that you can take, my wife's looking at me funny here, that you can take this, this multiple, multiplication of the number seven, right? Um, but we, we have here 10 candlesticks in Solomon's temple. And you know, is it possible that there are 10 major uh, way marks, even though this cosmic line shows seven, but that they would include um, some of the, the reform lines that we don't have on this line? That is, we don't have the period of the judges, for instance. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure how to do that. It's just an idea. So, <clears throat> you know, maybe I'm introducing a bunch of, of new concepts. The point that I'm trying to make here is that there is a lot more that we haven't seen and that is significant in understanding these lines. Now, another thing about the lines is we know that they're an analytical tool. Um, and if we take a story and we draw it on a line, we're going to see the same characteristics, no matter what that story is from God's word. And, and this is an illustration of the gospel. Um, I do have an idea here, though. Um, so I'm going to, you know, these are things I've been thinking about, just loose ends I'm trying to tie up here. So, so one of the things that we don't see, and maybe, maybe there should be a correction to this line in some way, but I, I don't know how to do it. Um, because when I, when I created this line, this cosmic line, or we did, I mean, 
the flood matches up with the Sunday law. We can see that quite clearly. Literal Israel matches up with spiritual Israel. Um, the creation of heaven and earth match up with the new heaven and the new earth. But we see that things are left out of this line. Now, one of the things about a line, and so I'm going to have to go to the whiteboard and sort of illustrate this that isn't well illustrated on this diagram. Because, you know, a part of what this has been about or a study of the understanding of the lines in general, and even in this simple understanding, is giving us the basic structures of how these lines work. And these come from uh, basically the line that begins and ends, the lines that begin and end the 2300 days, that is the Millerite line and also the line of the three decrees. So I'm going to try to go through this and illustrate this. So I have to remember to stop my sharing here. Okay, so whenever we looked at these lines, um, so I'm going to just deal with the decrees. With the decrees, we have <clears throat> first decree, second decree, oops, and the third decree. And, you know, we have Cyrus's. Darius and Artaxerxes. Now, with Artaxerxes' decree, we know that there's a further decree, and we often name this Nehemiah's decree. But it's really Artaxerxes' decree in his 20th year. And... Um, we would look at this as, of course, the start of the 2300 days, right? And this, this decree also has a form reform line attached to it. So what we have is we have so how many way marks do we have? Ten. Yeah, so there we have the 10. And so could we understand then that the 10 lampstands in Solomon's temple represent this whole line? That makes sense. Possibly. Okay. So, so one of the things we, we note in this, um, we have a 3-1 combination, right? Mm -hmm. But we have seven way marks here, and then we have these this extra three. And, and this, to me, is a complete, pro, uh, uh, a complete line, a reform line, but it's also a prophetic chain. So this goes back to the first meetings that I attended in Oklahoma in 2010, the prophetic chain. Now, at the time, Jeff was using uh, the people. He was using a three-one combination. There was a three, and then there was a fourth, and that fourth linked again to the next link in the chain. And, and this is sort of what we have here to look more level but you 
Does that make sense? Now, of course, if we take Millerite history, we have the same thing. We have a first, a second, and a third with all the seven decrees. And then we have this, the fourth. Now, the way that Jeff would address this initially is he would look at this as our history, right? So he would look at this as our history, and he would just say, this is our reform line. You know, eventually this is 9-11. You know, that's the time at the end. That's the Sunday law sort of way. I don't know if people remember that. But again, you see there is the 10, the 10 way marks. And that's at the beginning of the 2300 days. Right. And then this is going to end the 2300 days. So. Your uh, the camera. Camera. Oh, my camera's doing that again. Yeah, you're getting a good shot of the ceiling there. But anyway, does this make sense? That these are, to me, the primary reform lines that we have um, from which we've developed all the other reform It's lines. doing it again. Yeah, I'm not sure why it does that. But how's, well, that looks good. Okay. Um. Because these are the primary reform lines. Now, we've always said that Millerite history is the template. But when we talked about Millerite history, we were actually using the language of the decrees even before we understood the reform line of the decrees. Because we would talk about laying the foundation, right? But here, there's literally a foundation being laid in the decrees and we would talk about because we illustrated this as the building of the temple even before we had developed this reform line which i find interesting so this reform line actually helped us to recognize this reform line and once we have these two reform lines we can see that there is between these reform lines in the 2300 days we have other reform lines that all tie this together, right? So I'm gonna erase this. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got two, two more things to do here. This one and then the final one that kind of brings us back to the beginning. So if we look at this reform line, you got the three decrees, you have the fourth. Now the fourth is in the first generation. So we know we have a progressive destruction of four. So I'm gonna make this a little. And, and that's gonna be the first generation, right? So you're gonna have the first, the second, third and the fourth generation and in that fourth generation i'm not sure why i'm doing it that way you're then going to have another reform line now this history here is um is going to come to the time of christ so in the fourth generation we're going to have a period of darkness and then we're going to have a reform line so this reform line would be the reform line of Christ, however we want to understand this. So somewhere in here, we have the cross. We're not drawing out this reform line here. But after this reform line, we remember we have this first generation here, but we have a major reform line here. This is not a major reform line. This is a for, reform line that's part of this moving into a period of darkness. The reform line here is real. And then when we look at the history of Nehemiah, what occurs in this reform line become the stumbling blocks in this generation. That is the exclusiveness, 
So that is, they overcompensate. So they, um, in this history, but particularly in the Sabbath, the Sabbath becomes here, they're trying to protect, protect it. But as they get to this history, they're now just legalistic, right? So when you get to that fourth generation and you have that period of darkness, then you're going to have a reform line. Of course, this is going to start with uh, the birth of John the Baptist. But you have this reform line here. And then after this reform line, you're going to have a progressive destruction of four again, right? So you're going to have Smyrna, uh, no, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, right? So you're going to have these four generations. And then you're going to have a reform line. And in that reform line, um, that's going to be Millerite history. And then again, in Millerite history, you're going to have, let's say this is Millerite history. Then you're going to have the repeat of that first generation, 1863, establishment of the Adventist church. That's this building of the streets and walls, right? Right. And then you're going to have four generations. And then you're going to have the actual reform line. And this will then be the reform line of the 144,000, right? The final reform line. Right? But we could go back to the beginning and see this. Now, in this, we will see that there are reform lines that are the fourth, but they're not major reform lines. And they're not really a zoom into one of these. They're actually their own reform line themselves, but they occur in the first generation. Now, there are a few of these that exist that we haven't put on our chart. So this is, so if we have this golden candlestick idea, this is the one that covers the whole of history, right? So you got new heaven and a new earth. Right here, you have creation. And then we have the flood. Right. And then we have literal Israel. Then we have the cross. And then we have spiritual Israel. And then we have the Sunday law here this history right so that's our cosmic line but we have some major reform lines at least i would think of them as reform lines that parallel what we see in the that first generation now here we're going to have uh, a reform line and i'm just going to put it down here the tower of babel And why am I singling out the Tower of Babel here as a reform line? Well, the, um, just thinking that doesn't wasn't that a period of darkness? Right. So this is a falling away, right? But right. if we think about the fact we have a major reform line in the first generation, you have a falling away. Now, how the Tower of Babel fits in here, we say that it ends up being this, this period of darkness. We, we haven't really looked at this reform line or, the, or this in detail, because when we were first going through understanding the lines, we passed through a lot of this, this history. We never really addressed it. We just, we just addressed it um, in, in briefly as that this is a progressive destruction of four. So this is going to lead up to the period of darkness. And, and tied into this is uh, the table of the nations, right? But that's Genesis chapter 10 that deals with uh, uh, the population, po populating of the earth, right? The, all the I'm correct in that. Is it 10? I always forget. Yes. Okay, yeah. And, and the reason why I say it's 10 is because I, I think, well, it must have to do with uh, the
the 10 symbolizes the world. That's how I remember it. Um, it but I sounds also, logical. 13, 13 represents rebellion. So then I was thinking, well, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is chapter 13. But, but I know that that has to do with uh, Abraham. So um, yeah, so this is uh, the Tower of Babel occurs in this history. But even in a progressive destruction of four, we know that there is a reform line that's happening during this period, right? So we have this period of darkness. So there's something happening here that is a reform line. And we, we never really address that. But, but this to me represents that first generation after the flood. How, however, we, we want to uh, structure it. And then of course, that's why we end up with literal Israel because the world has failed and now all that he can do is he can find one person, Abram, and he calls him out of Ur of the Chaldees, right? And, and now that seed of the woman can continue. It's been carrying through this history, but now we're going to have that, that promise of the seed now being given to Abram, and it's, you're going to have this nation that then is going to uh, develop from that. Okay. Now, in trying to figure out something like the Tower of Babel, well, we can say with each of these, there is a building, right? But when, when it deals with literalism, we have all these reform lines in there. Um, but to say when literal Israel ends, well, we know literal Israel uh, still continues past the cross by... Um, you know, 39 years, 40 years. It's the 40th year after the cross that we have the end of it. And spiritual Israel uh, spans this period of time as well. But is it, it, you know, there's an overlap, a transition period between literal and spiritual Israel. Uh, and we haven't defined all these reform lines, especially when it comes to the cross, right, in the center here. Um, but we know we have spiritual Israel on this side. And we have, um, this is the Tower of Babel, but after the cross, we're going to have another history in here, which is, is an extension of this, but this is, this is 70 AD. And, and why would I parallel 70 AD as something similar to the Tower of Babel? Well, you have a, a destruction. Yeah, so you have a destruction of a city and, of course, the temple. Now, um, And then, um, what other histories would parallel this if we move further down? Can we do this again anywhere in here as we move further down? This Maybe not. What would you say, Stephen? Maybe 9-11. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking you have like that towers. Wasn't, yeah, destroyed. We have the towers destroyed. Um, I never thought about 9-11. Um, and we know that this is a type of the destruction of the end of the world. And so is this. Now, of course, the flood is as well. But the flood is not destroying a building and, and maybe, you know. So, well, before the Sunday law, you're gonna have 9-11. I'm, I'm gonna put 9-11 here. Um, but before we have a new heaven and a new earth, we also have to, they have to be destroyed, right? And, and that, I, that's what I was more thinking of is that there is the, a destruction of the earth.
the heavens and the earth. Right? <clears throat> and so what we haven't really done, what we haven't well defined is how this pro prophetic chain works all along the way. We haven't looked at all of the links of the chain. Um, but what I am saying is that there is, even though we have these major reform lines, I mean, this one has lots of reform lines in it. And, and they're, they're going to link together. Right? So you, you, you can, so instead of just looking at these seven, we could just draw the line where we have this whole chronological connection from creation to re the recreation of the heaven and earth with the major reform lines that continue. So we know that there's more reform lines than this, but what we have been saying is that when we zoom into literal Israel, we find these other reform lines and that these are our main reform lines. But uh, we also have... Uh, you know, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, yeah. but me, uh, I've been trying to actually build that. <laughs> I, I've been finding some mistakes in in uh, Stephen's um, uh, just transcription mistakes. But I have that. I have the from from Adam all the way to uh, at this point. All I've got is it up to uh, 3454 or 4, 592 BC, which is Jehoiakim's captivity or fifth year of it. But I do have that all in an Excel sheet all the way across with all them lines. If you want it, I'll send it to you. Okay. Yeah. So then when we zoomed into literal Israel, we again had... Uh, a reform line that had seven way marks. And when we did that, we didn't have a place for the judges, right? We, we would say, well, the judges is a progressive destruction of four, right? Um, or it's, you know, it's, it becomes a falling away. But I'm not completely satisfied with how we're doing this. That is, I think there are things that we are missing as far as how to put it all together. Um, and so even though we can do this, and I'm not saying this is wrong, we know that there are details that we could put here as these major things like the Tower of Babel. It's just, it's not part of literal Israel. It's not part of the flood. We know it's part of this progressive destruction of four. But during a progressive destruction of four, there are reform lines. You know, we see a reform line in, in the story of Josiah, and he's in that first of the progressive destructions of four. We also see even Manessa has a reform line, right? So how we define this, how we parse these out, I don't think we're going to be able to do this in this these series of presentations. At least I'm not planning to. It's going to be more part of um, as we continue in the understanding of the lines, which I believe is going to continue for quite a while. That's our main study of the mornings. But I wanted to introduce this idea in this more simple representation that people understand where we're coming from in how we put together these lines. <clears throat> I don't know if that's helpful. People find that uh, helpful in what we did there or not. Not just you, but pe other people watching. <clears throat> right. And then we had developed all of these other lines. So these are things that we, we haven't gone through in this series of studies, but um, I'm just going to quickly flip through here. So, yeah, here we are at the judges line. I wanted the this is it. literal Israel. 
so we can see if, if we looked at literal Israel, we're going to go from Abraham all the way uh, to Ezra. Now, somebody would say, well, why aren't we going all the way to the cross? Because Ezra, that seventh um, way mark, is going to give us the 70 weeks. And that 70 weeks is going to lead us to the cross. But also what we need to do with these is add an eighth. Right. So in this one, if we're going to add, um, we're going to sort of complete this, we would then have another reform line here. I'm just going to do it this way. Now, so when we look at this, this last one, the fourth angel arriving, and we have it, the eighth way mark, well, this would be Nehemiah's history, right? That's how we would just generally look at it. But we can also see that it refers to the period of Christ's line as well, because that's another way we can look at this line, because this is how... Um, we did it in our history, Jeff did it. If we had Millerite history, we have the, the seven way marks. And then he would just say, well, the fourth angel arriving, that's the Sunday law um, that Ellen White's talking about. That's the second angel, it's the fourth angel. But we, we saw that that would be more parallel with the line of going from literal Israel, and then you would have the end of literal Israel, this would be this, um, the line of Christ would be the fourth, right? So, so this could represent either one. This could be the history of Nehemiah, or this could be the reform line of Christ that's being marked here. Does that make sense to people? Okay, Angela asks why Moses is not a judge, because he's not never considered one of the judges. Stephen, do you have an answer for that? How you understand the judges? Um, yeah, I would normally just uh, start the judges at Joshua. Yeah, so Josh was the first judge? Well, I see, I don't usually even put Joshua as a judge. Certainly in the time, the judges. You know, for the, for the period of the the time span, mm -hmm. maybe you could maybe not a judge, but yeah, he's more of like our leader, right? So, yeah. so what is a judge particularly? Why are they called judges? You have an answer for that? I mean, I I just to me, I see him uh, Joshua as distinct from these judges. So, so one one thing for for Moses, of course, is he's um, uh, you know, he's connected with the Levitical line, right? <clears throat> and I mean, he's he's raised up. He's a he's a, a Christ character in the sense, a Messiah, right? He's a parallel to Christ, like Joseph is. Um, but his role is is different than the judge. The judges are just basically raised up to deliver them from an enemy. Right in the land of Israel, where you know Moses actually brings them out of Egypt, so it's it's a, a different role. But I was wondering but if there's... he did sit as a judge. Read Exodus eighteen thirteen to twenty six. Mm -hmm. It talks very explicitly about him judging. Yeah, I understand that, but I'm just saying that he's not considered one of the judges because the judges is a specific period. But even Joshua. I don't consider to be one of the judges. The judges are going to be raised up because of the enemies that are left in the land. That, that's how I would define the judge, right? They're going to be in that period where they, in a sense, have fallen away. So, I, you know, I just wouldn't consider Moses as part of the period of the judges. 
yeah, he does judge function, but uh... <clears throat> but anyway, getting back to to this to this point here, is it making sense that we can we can always see seven way marks and then the eighth, and the eighth is the second. And that this pattern happens in prophecy, obviously in Revelation 17. But this is the structure. This is the prophetic chain. This is your basic structure. It's seven way marks and an eighth. And the eighth becomes this link. Right. It begins the four, the first generation. There's four generations. It's the first that you have this, but it continues to link us through. And we could zoom into these links. So these links exist on different levels. They exist with every reform line, no matter where we are on that uh um, what do you call it when you zoom in? Can't think of the word. <clears throat> no, when you zoom in on uh, like a telescope. Um, I can't think of the word. That's the problem with daylight savings. I'm Focus in on it? I don't know. Uh, yeah, they call it a um, magnification. Up. A magnification. You know, no matter what your magnification is, you're still going to always have this structure. That is, you never have a reform line where a third angel arrives and it's not followed by a fourth angel in the first generation. That is, um, this, this link always has to be there in every reform line. And so they're, they're all linked together right from the beginning to the end. This, this was the main idea that Jeff brought out in the prophetic chain. But at that time, he wasn't using the, the first, second, and third angel's message. He was using a 3-1 combination, but it always was individuals that would end up linking this. And, and we saw this in the, on the very basic level of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's three. Joseph is the fourth. Right, so that would be your, 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 your three plus the one, and then that one starts another generation, or he starts another reform line. So I hope that's clear. I'm not doing a very good job explaining it. <clears throat> and so that's to me that's a weakness of how we've always presented the lines. Because we can put line upon line, and we could see, but we would always just go to the third angel arrives, pretty much. Occasionally, we would have the fourth angel, but this is a feature of every reform line. Whether it's an individual reform line or not, even, even for individuals, this would occur. And then, of course, we can zoom into each one of these way marks and have a reform line. But that means there is also a, a link that links each one of these way marks together. So if we, if we went into Abraham's reform line, we would see that there is a falling away, right? And then that falling away is going to link us to the next reform line. So maybe that's what we should do next week is we could go to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and look at their reform lines again, uh, just on a, a simpler basis, because we did those in the morning studies, um, but we haven't we haven't, I've referred to it, but we haven't looked at it again since then. That was a long time ago. That was when we started this series. Um, well, it wasn't right at the beginning. It would have been like March or something like that last year. So about a year ago. <clears throat> but 
A any thoughts about what, what I'm talking about here? As I'm done my presentation, I don't have anything more to say because otherwise it would take a lot longer uh, to look at that. But I think we could do that next week, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and illustrate this, how the line of Abraham connects to the line of Isaac, how the line of Isaac connects to the line of Jacob. And, and even put Joseph in there because that's going to be 3-1. Any thoughts? Any questions? Not really, but, you know, um, that was an interesting observation about the 10 candlesticks. And, I mean, I remember seeing it a while back, but never really gave it much thought. But now that we've been using this um, candlestick, per se, the the seven the seven way marks. Yes. Yeah. Some um it it, it kind of makes sense um for those for those 10 marks but because i was just seeing when i kept seeing the when you just mentioned the the 10 candles or i'm sorry when steven told us it was 10 uh, my mind kept going to the 70 weeks mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely um now, another thing, too, when, when we look at that uh, the cosmic line there, I just want to go back there again. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things about this line, I mean, it makes sense how it's lined up. Now, the new heaven and new earth being the arrival of the third angel. Uh, we know that it's going to have a reform line with it itself. And, and that reform line is going to reach, uh, you know, it's going to have a time of the end. It's going to have a period of darkness. It's going to have <clears throat> then the arrival of the first angel. It's going to have the arrival of the second angel, and then the third. And, um, you know, we have never drawn out that line. I know it would include... Uh, the great white throne judgment, you know, with Jerusalem coming down from heaven. There's there's lots attached to it. Um, and it's one I've always wanted to do, but we've never done. Um, but then we have this, this waymark here, what we call the Sunday law waymark. And, you know, and that's the empowerment of the second angel in this cosmic line. But of course, it's the arrival of the second angel in uh, Ellen White's line. And then we have this spiritual Israel that includes, of course, it does include uh, the nation at spiritual Israel at the end of time, right? So in some ways, literal Israel and spiritual Israel are extremely broad uh, reform lines or, or way marks on this cosmic line. So, I mean, I'm interested to see how we're going to sort through some of this. But we definitely can see the parallel between the Sunday law and the flood. That has to be there. I just don't see any other way to construct this line. That's basically what I'm trying to say. Well, each one of those things definitely has its tie to the branch. Yes. Um. And we can see that, obviously. Mm. And, but w w I don't think we were actually thinking about any of that stuff when we were doing this, when you laid this whole thing out. That wasn't that wasn't really a thought. It, the, it, the we, we saw it afterwards, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we had a lot of trouble trying to figure out what should be what um, mm -hmm. throughout all of these lines, yeah. mostly, especially in those judges' lines. Right, and we're sorting them through. We can now see how these lines are structured much better than we could before. And, and mostly it's just Absolutely. so we understand our own line better. Right, that's the, the main part. Okay, well, thanks for the comments. I'm very tired, so let's uh, close with a word of prayer. 
A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this afternoon and for each person and their participation. We ask for um, your continued presence in our lives, in our study, in our thoughts. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you can um, bring us together again to study your word. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.